Welcome to my economics channel where I love discussing the subject but also I like simplifying it and making it an interesting subject to engage with. And in today's episode, what I actually thought I'd tackle is all this credit creation, money printing or money creation that's happening around the world. More specifically, I want to talk about how and why we can create money and even deeper than that, how we create credit and what's the difference between money and credit. Of course, I can't explain in detail all of the operations happening around the world regarding money now, but what I can do is I can craft a narrative, a story, with you as a banker or a creditor in the center, and that will help you understand how and why we create money, and ultimately how and why the modern monetary system works. For this video, I'm drawing upon the work of Peter Temin, and in particular, the Roman market economy, I'm also drawing upon the work of David Graeber, and in particular his book, Debt, The First 5,000 Years. There are other sources that talk about money creation, and in particular credit creation, that I'll link to down below. But let's start our story in Ancient Rome. Why Ancient Rome? Well, it's why I chose the Peter Temin book. Because we have very good evidence that banks, or simply bank-like entities, actually existed back then. And of course they weren't the big behemoths, and there was no financial industry back then. So in some ways it's quote-unquote simpler to understand. But in particular, let's put you in the role of a wealthy creditor. Let's say you're a wealthy landowner, you own multiple houses, multiple villas, and you have people working on these villas, you might have a few slaves, but generally you're rich and you're well connected. And in particular back then, being rich and well connected were one in the same. But as an aside, this is why in the media, and in particular in the financial media, they're always talking about credit conditions. It matters who has access to credit, and especially if poorer people can get access to credit, because this access to credit can lift them out of poverty and do all sorts of other marvelous things. But let's go back to you. So you're a wealthy creditor. Let's say the son of a family friend comes to you, he has a business idea. Let's say it's a bakery. Maybe he has worked in his father's bakery, he's got the skills, he just now needs money. He needs credit to start his own bakery, or maybe he even wants to do an expansion of the current business. But either way, he's come to you because you are the wealthy creditor, you're the banker, you're the ancient banker. All right, so he needs money. How are you gonna give him the money? Let's say you draw a bit of an income and you have cash that's physically stored somewhere in your house. It's safely guarded and maybe it's there for a rainy day. Fair enough. Are you gonna lend any of this out? Well, probably not. You might say something like, I am good for the money. If you take this letter, let's call it a promissory note, and you take it to the person you want to buy from, and if they know me well, they will take this as payment. You will then be able to buy the equipment you need to either start your new business or expand your current business. And that seems very natural to do. You're good for the money. You're rich. You have multiple estates. You have an income. You have cash that is stashed away, and you're in good standing in the community. But notice here, you haven't actually given away any cash. You've given away promissory note. You've given away credit. You've expanded credit. Let's say this family friend then presents this note and buys the materials. For the sake of this example, let's say he buys it from one shopkeeper. Why would that shopkeeper accept your credit? Remember, this is not money. This is not gold or silver. This is not the emperor's money. So how and why would this person take this as payment? In this example, the person is taking that credit as payment, that promissory note, because they know you personally. They know you are good for the money. And by extension, why are you good for the money? Not because you're going to sell for villas, not because you're going to give up your income, not because you're going to give up the coins that you've stashed away but because you can count on that family friend to make money from his business venture. The reason you can create this credit and the reason it's not inflationary is because the family friend is going to use it to create new value. He's gonna create something new that people can then enjoy, something else that people can spend their money on. When he collects that money, he gives that money to you and that is the sense in which you are good for the money. Your money, which you will then earn from that business venture, will then go and pay off that credit that you expanded. Money will then come into being because of the credit that you expanded. And that money then pays off that merchant. And that is why that merchant accepted that credit in the first place. And this is how you get growth. You extended credit because you expect some sort of interest on that. The only place that interest can come from is the new growth that will be generated by the use of that credit. Either the new business that will be started or the business expansion will generate a new money because people now have something else, something new to spend their money on, they come to that business and that money will then funnel over to you and ultimately to the business that your family friend purchased from. But let's make this more concrete. Let's actually rewind. Let's say he comes to you and instead of expanding credit, you instead give him those coins that you have stashed away. 
Let's say it represents all of your savings. You then give that family friend that money to then use, to then make the purchases and start or expand his business. But let's consider, why do you have that money stashed away? You have that money stashed away specifically for a reason. The reason you're not using that money somewhere else is because currently it's in its best use. Maybe you have it saved for a rainy day. And if you give away that money, if you loan that money out, you're then risking that rainy day fund. But let's not consider that money. Let's say you didn't have that money and you just had the property. Let's say you then sell one of your properties for money and then you lend out that money. Well, what then? In that case, let's consider. You've sold your villa. All that has happened then is that ownership of that villa has been transferred over to someone else. They've given you money and you've got that money now. But this doesn't represent new money in the economy. This is just switching hands. That person had the money previously, which has now gone to you. And that villa, which previously belonged to you, now goes to them. When you're then lending that money out, you're not lending out new credit. You're not lending out new money. You're lending out existing money. There is a sense in which that family friend taking that money to start or expand the business is not new wealth for Rome. It doesn't represent something new because you haven't created new credit. But we can go further. If money then already has to exist in the economy for you to then be able to lend it out, how did you then get the villa in the first place? You might say you inherited it from your parents, but then how did your parents or your ancestors get that villa? Where did that money come from? Of course, the origins of money are murky, but it is most likely that credit came first. Credit was extended first, and this represented new growth, and money was there to settle the credit. The point I'm making is that the only way you could have owned those five villas is because of credit that came before you, or credit that you brought to the table. Some value which you've provided to society, which has generated new growth, has allowed you to purchase those villas. Of course, this is a very rosy view, and I don't mean to apply that credit and money are always good. Of course, there are people that steal, there are people with ill-gotten gains, and there are people that should not have the amount of money that they do. But I'm talking about in a best case scenario, and I'm talking about growth in general. It requires credit, and it's always required credit. This is why I put you in the role as the creditor back in ancient Rome. It's something that's easier to visualize. You can see that if someone came to you and you knew them well, and you knew they were good for that business, you would extend them credit, knowing that they are good for that business. Whether consciously or not, by expanding that credit, by being good for the money or being good for the credit, you are creating new growth. And in fact, that's the only way new growth can happen. And so this is why credit creation is not inflationary. Naturally, this assumes that the credit will be used wisely. But in this case, we rely on the judgment of individual banks on how they extend credit. We expect them to be prudent. Likewise, we would expect you back in ancient Rome to also be prudent with how you extended credit. You wouldn't sell off your villas, you wouldn't give away your money, you wouldn't give up your income. Nothing else would change except for the credit which is created. To make this point clear and to bring it to the modern economy, the only people whom your family friend can purchase from with that new credit that you've created are people who already know you. These are people who know you personally and know that you're good for the money. It's not any old shop that would accept that credit because they don't know you. They don't know that they're going to be paid back the money because it's the money that matters, not the credit. The credit represents the money that will come. The credit just pulls the spending forward. You don't then have to somehow save up all this money to then spend it on a business venture. The credit is created for that business venture. And so this is generally why we see that throughout most of history, it's generally only the well-connected and the rich who have access to credit. They must know each other well to accept new credit as payment because they have their own bills to pay. So when we propel ourselves forward to the modern financial system, modern banking and the financial system is these rich creditors. Generally speaking, the more financialization, the more banks, the more that they're connected, the better. Because this allows more people to get access to credit and spend that credit. Because if someone is outside of the financial system, they then can't accept payments from someone inside the financial system. They also can't get credit from the financial system. And this is why credit and credit conditions are so key to the modern economy. This is why it matters so much. And this is why the Federal Reserve and all the central banks around the world, why them extending credit to businesses and to individuals matters so much. So I'll finish off with modern banking. You can now see that modern banks don't take in savings and then make those as loans to entrepreneurs. They create credit, which then will create new growth. Because absence that credit, the new growth would not happen. We could not enjoy the modern world that we do today. 
And the reason this is not inflationary, the reason this is not dangerous, is because that new growth represents new wealth. It represents new things that people can then enjoy. And because they're willing to pay for these new experiences that did not exist before, this is what creates new wealth, but also allows that loan to be paid back. And this is why we can see new things constantly being created. New categories of goods and services constantly come out. Goods and services are improved. The reason is because of new credit which is created. And it harkens back from that simple example I gave of you as a creditor. And the point here is that the more people have access to credit, the more likely it is that entrepreneurs with new and exciting ideas can bring them to the market and can ultimately expand our horizons with new things that we can experience. And of course, ultimately to make us better off. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope that was helpful. Thank you for watching. Subscribe, rate and share all the good stuff. It definitely helps my channel and I'll see you guys next time.